Okay, so our, next, our next speaker is uh, Lucy Lai, and she is from Harvard University uh, in Massachusetts. And she's going to tell us about a computational division of labor for motor skill learning. So thanks very much for being here, and we look forward to your talk. All right. So thank you for the introduction. Um, and thank you to the organizers for giving me this opportunity to share my work. So like Anne said, I'm going to give a talk on what I consider to be evidence for a computational division of labor in the brain for motor skill learning. And this is done in collaboration with um, Gerald Foe and Ben Ovechsky, who are just our next door neighbors here at Harvard. All right, so motor skill learning, as well as reinforcement learning in general, requires that agents both learn the structure and the parameters um, of their environment that best maximize expected reward. So more specifically, we consider structure learning as the learning of the relevant state space, or in other words, what features of the environment are relevant to the task. On the other hand, parameter learning is any kind of learning that's conditional on the state space. So for example, learning what actions to perform in each state, uh, which is just the policy. So to make this even more concrete, I'm gonna give an example using my favorite motor learning skill, which is playing the piano. So you can think of the relevant state space of the task as being the specific set of keys used in any particular song that you're playing. So if I'm playing a song in C major, these would be the set of keys that I would be using as opposed to if I were playing a song in F sharp major. And once I know this set of st states or the, the keys or the states that are relevant for the particular song, then I can learn the parameters of the song, which include when to press what key for how long and in what order. So as you can see, both these processes are important for successful motor skill learning. And so we wanted to know how structure and parameter learning are implemented in the brain, and specifically if they're subserved by distinct circuits or if they're integrated into a distributed system. So unfortunately, we can't teach animals to play piano, but we can teach them to press levers. So we turned to a motor skill learning task that the Ovexi lab developed a couple years ago in order to answer this question. Um, so this is called the two tap task, and it requires that a rat tap a lever twice with a 700 millisecond delay in between in order to get a reward. Um, and I hope this video is not too laggy, but I will first point out that this is the lever that is going to be pressed. This is the water spout where the reward's being collected. And then when the lever is pressed, you'll see a white square appear at the top of each one of these frames. So the video is gonna play in real time first, which it might be laggy, but it'll be slowed down uh, after that. All right, now it's slowed down. All right, so you can see he does a little dance to, to make the task work. Okay, so animals get really good at this task over the course of about a month. And to give you an idea of what this behavior looks like, here I've plotted the interpress interval over thousands of trials, where the more red density here means uh, more taps. So you can see how animals learn to elongate their interpress interval over time. So we wanted to know if motor cortex was necessary for maintaining this motor skill once it was acquired. So Risa, the first author of this paper, um, lesioned both the primary and secondary forelimb areas here, and uh, then asked whether the animal could maintain this uh, IPI. And as you can see, there's almost no fluctuation or no forgetting of this learned skill. And notably, these lesion animals still exhibit the same stereotyped dance that you saw in the video earlier. So we then asked whether intact and expert lesioned animals could modify the timing of their interpress intervals, which we can consider to be like a parameter. Um, and we did this by shifting the interpress interval target from 700 to 500 milliseconds, and then back to 700 milliseconds. And what's pretty incredible is that expert lesion animals can do this as well without their motor cortex. So in contrast, if you lesion an animal before training on this task, it's unable to successfully learn the IPI. So here I'm plotting the intact in uh, black and the 
motor cortex lesioned animals in red. And you can see this is big discrepancy in both the IPI that's being learned as well as the variability in the timing of their actions. Okay, so now the task structure isn't just this simple because in fact, if the animal gets the IPI wrong, they get sent into this timeout period um, or this inter-trial interval for 1200 milliseconds before being able to initiate the next trial with another tap. So now here I'm showing the inter-trial interval in intact animals. And as you can see over time, they eventually learn that this is indeed a different criteria. But in contrast, these naive lesion animals, they never learn this criteria and essentially they treat it as if it doesn't exist. So I didn't mention this earlier, but this entire task is learned by trial and error. So there's no cues whatsoever uh, to tell the animal that these are indeed distinct states. Okay, so you might be able to see where I'm going with this. Um, because successful learning of the two top task requires learning that the task is structured in this particular way with distinct IPI and ITI states, as well as learning when to tap within the IPI state in order to get a reward. And so this data so far seem to suggest that these two processes are dissociable when it comes to what brain areas are involved. So in particular, it seems like motor cortex and these other subcortical regions are required for learning both the structure and the parameters of the task. But only subcortical controllers are required for executing the task and for per performing this reward dependent parameter learning um, once the state space is already learned. And it's important to know, I'm not necessarily saying that motor cortex performs structure learning, but that it's a necessary hub for conveying that structural information to the subcortex. Okay, so in order to formalize this hypothesis, um, I developed a reinforcement learning model composed of structure learning and parameter learning components that operate in parallel. And so the job of the structure learning component is to arbitrate between possible task structures that might explain the agent's environment. And it does this by inferring the posterior over MDPs, uh, which is in, in essence what we call a belief state. So it's like, what is the, my belief of uh, the model of the world given the data that I'm receiving? And so we modeled this in a pretty simplistic manner, which is just allowing the agent to consider two different MDPs, the first being a world with just one state and the other uh, being accurate to the actual task with both IPI and ITI states. So the idea is over learning the agent um, or the animal learns that the second MDP is actually the more faithful representation of the world. And then it updates the posterior on that to reflect that belief. Um, and so in our simulations, we model lesions as a freezing of this inference process. So there's no more updating of the belief state after lesion. Um, so now the purpose of the parameter learning component is to learn the correct state action mapping given a particular MDP or state space. So in our, in our model, this takes the form of the traditional actor critic setup, with the caveat that policies and values are learned on the belief state since the actual state is not known. Okay, so in the next few slides, I'm gonna show that our agent successfully captures the behavior that we want. So all the data will be on the left and all the simulations will be on the right. Okay, so first off here, I'm showing that our agent does capture the learning trajectory of animals. Um, it, su it successfully learns the IPI and it decreases its timing variability uh, over learning. Okay, then when we change our criteria from 500 milliseconds uh, or sorry, 700 milliseconds to 500, and then back to 700, both of our simulated intact and lesion animals can effectively adapt uh, just like the animals. Okay, but in contrast, these naive lesion animals, so again, lesioned, the belief state updating process is uh, fixed before learning. Um, they're, they're not able to learn the IPI and their variability in, in their IPI remains quite high here in red compared to the intact agents. Okay, and then lastly, intact agents are able to learn that the ITI exists and that they should wait 1,000, 1, 1,200 milliseconds after an unrewarded trial in order to restart the trial structure. Um, and this is in, contact, in contrast to MC lesion, lesion agents that are still unable to learn this criteria. Okay, 
I'll pause briefly um, and show a slightly different way of looking at the data, which is to plot both the IPI and the ITI on the same plot, just in different colors. So the red is the IPI, the green blue is the ITI. Um, and so in the next plot, I basically show that these naive lesioned agents, so this is real data again, and this is simulated data, they show no distinction between the actions that taken in the IPI versus the ITI. Okay, so given all this and using our model, we had this idea that if the only thing that naive lesion agent uh, animals are lacking is an accurate state representation, then if you provide the animal with explicit structure cues, such as a sound played for the duration of the IPI, um, that should be the only thing that's necessary to rescue state distinction. And this proved to be true when I simulated this in a naive lesion agent, and I provided feedback here at this thin green line. Um, and you can see that there starts to be a separation between the green and the red, showing that the IPI and the ITI are becoming distinct. So we began testing this hypothesis in animals, and here I'm plotting three different naive lesion animals with no sensory feedback, and on the bottom, three with sensory feedback. And as you can see, the lesion animals with feedback seem to successfully learn a distinction between the IPI and the ITI. So putting this all together, both the data and the modeling suggest that motor cortex is required for providing the information about task structure, but not for adapting learned learn movements. And the striatum and other subcortical areas can support this reward-based parameter learning in the absence of motor cortex. So to me, one of this, the things this framework suggests is that motor cortex lesion animals uh, should be able to learn a parametric only version of this task without motor cortex. And that remains a further, an avenue of further exploration. Um, so where does this lead us? So I think that we can agree that we still don't quite understand how biological agents learn the relevant state space. Um, and even the task that I just showed you, we just provided two possible state spaces, but we didn't explain where they came from. Um, so in this vein, I've always sort of admired Yale Neve's work on how humans do structure learning. So if you're interested in that, her papers are a good place to start. And since this is a conference at the intersect of AI and neuroscience, it makes me wonder two things off the bat. The first is how might we teach skilled autonomous robots to discover the relevant state space um, or features such that we don't have to hand it to them beforehand? And then what are the exact benefits or disadvantages of modular design as I suggested in this talk? So some of the things I thought about are a balance of robustness and flexibility, the fact that modularity reduces interference, um, and one classic example is catastrophic forgetting. Um, and then also the fact that you can build hierarchies of modules. So I'll just end with this, um, that I may suggest that in this age of CNNs, RNNs, ANNs, DNNs, and what have you, uh, perhaps we could gain something by returning to a more modular or compositional design of artificially intelligent systems. So with that, I wanna thank our collaborators, uh, Bense Olerski and Gerald Fo, who did, uh, Gerald is a postdoc who did most of this unpublished experimental work as well as my wonderful advisor, Sam Gershman, and then you guys for listening. Um, and here's where you can find me on the interwebs and of course on Slack. So thanks again. Okay, great talk. Thank you very much. Um, we have time for just a couple of questions. Um, we're gonna start with uh, Josh Burke, who says, um, it's nice that you can model the arbitration between task structures, but isn't the harder part to learn what those task structures are in the first place? Yeah, that's exactly what I was, um, pointing out uh, at the very end, it's, I, I really don't know. Um, and even in like the work on partially observable MDPs in the machine learning literature, um, it's sort of hard to, at least for me, it was hard for me to get a grasp on like how these things are learned. So definitely a further avenue of further exploration. Okay, great. And then a question from uh, John Krakauer, who <laughs> wonders whether the, uh, the IPI and the ITI, or sorry, I'll just read this. Is it not the case? <laughs> <laughs> the IPI and ITI structure not discovered exact, or I guess he meant to say we're not discovered exactly yeah. in parallel. So it, it seems just learning the 700 millisecond interval itself requires motor cortex. Did you get that? There are quite a few. So models. yeah, um, this is true. So it seems just learning the 700 millisecond. 
Yeah, I think the distinction is not um, entirely clear because again, like it depends on how you parameterize the state space, right? And at least in the way that I've done it, um, I've assumed like time is discretized in a certain way, but um, you might ask, well, how do animals even know that time is the relevant feature to, um, to learn on? And that again, gets back at the first question that Josh asked. So it's a good point. And it's not as, it's perhaps not as clean. It's definitely not as clean as I presented it. Okay, great. Well, there were a couple more questions um, from Zach Pitkow, who says you gave a great talk, but I think we're going to have to defer those to the, to the Slack in the interest of time, Lucy, if you're able to go to the Slack. Sure, thank you. Uh, so thank you again for a great talk. Um, and so I've been uh, notified that we are, are meant to have a 10 minute break so that people can stretch their legs and possibly eat a peanut butter sandwich. So I would recommend that everybody do that. And then we will um, start again just after 40 minutes past the hour. So see you all soon.